for me, it's a mental challenge. Uh, and my mental challenge is being able to get out of bed every day there. Invictus is not about going there to win medals, and if you're there to win medals, you're probably going for the wrong reasons. It has to be part of your, your journey through your, through your injury, through your illness. Everyone should get a medal. You've already won, in my mind, by turning up. I joined the Army back in uh, September 1992 uh, as, a, as a medic. Uh, served as a medic for about 10-ish about years before going to university to become a radiographer, paid by the Defence Force, and then spent the remainder of my uh, 30 years service as a health officer in various roles. I've been to uh, East Timor and Bougainville and then East Timor again, or, or Timor-Leste as it's called now. I wouldn't say I was a, 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 a warry uh, person, if you like. I mean, that's why I joined medical. I joined medical to help people, uh, you know, people that can't help themselves or that need a, need a hand, hand. And that's that's pretty much been that was my path through the whole time I was in the defence force was to be in a field where you're able to help people rather than to, you know, the sort of the blunt side of the military or the stuff that you see on TV. This was my fourth deployment. Kandahar is a massive, or was a massive base where they, there was you know, 20, 30,000 30, people, I don't know the exact number. In an austere environment, uh, so you're working within you know, a tent or you're working in a whole bunch of containers. Um, you know, in a war zone where you've got you know, uh, shells coming in, you've got casualties coming in with all sorts of different injuries. And we would treat both Taliban and coalition uh, as well as Afghan army or Afghan police in the same trauma bay at the same time. Uh, which you can imagine that's incredibly challenging when you've got a, a Taliban fighter right next to the guy that he potentially has wounded. Day two, I was in the trauma bay. Uh, two casualties came in and they were missing, well, two of them were missing limbs. Uh, they were both being worked on, doing CPR. You know, you, you're just suddenly going, okay, this is a real deal. This is actually not a drill. This is not what we've trained to do through scenarios. This is actually happening. Those two died that day. So in the first you know, couple of days, two people had died right in front of us. You, you would probably work, I think we figured it out, around 13 hours a day, but it was, but it was broken. You, know, you would be there eight to four, and then, and then you might be there six till ten in the, in the evening and then maybe again you know sort of one till four in the morning you're wearing body armor the majority of the time and it's and it's hot kandahar is a really busy airfield there are planes choppers drones going off all the time every time you hear a certain noise you think oh that's that's the chopper going out to get someone you know maybe i should wait my make my way down to the trauma base and so yeah, you just your anxiety is always high. Early on in the tour, maybe sort of a month into it, once the sort of I don't know the adrenaline had worn off, I was I was quite self-aware, and I was like, well, we're dealing with quite traumatic patients on a daily basis. This is this is has the potential to impact me, um, and so that's where I. I sought out the uh, advice of one of the psych nurses to talk through um, what we're dealing with and to help to normalize it and we certainly tried that for a little bit uh, but then I, I yeah I ended up getting too hard talking about it I actually didn't want to talk about it because you know you need to be there you know this this person lying in front of you the casualty has has had a way worse day than you are and you need to get there to to help to promote their recovery so they can get back to their loved ones. Um, and so, and so that, and it's things like that that you just push your own emotions down and just get on with, with life. You become a zombie where you're almost fast forwarding through days and scenarios to try and get to the end. It's weird, isn't it? Because you come from a country where everything's grey or sandy colour. Worried about, you know, suicide bombers coming into your camp or rocket attacks. Um, and just eyeballing everyone who's in and around camp. Uh, just because by the end of it, I was very paranoid about everything. But when you bring that back to downtown Palmerston North, uh, it doesn't quite work. 
I would avoid, uh, you know, crowded places. Uh, even just going to the mall, I didn't like because there's just way too many people. Because I can't keep an eye on everyone. Because you're still there, you're still in Afghan, and so you're just on edge the whole time. That really never went away until I got treatment in 2022. The wife was seeing the worst of me. So it was before work I was horrible, after work I was horrible. But the yeah. massive mood swings, um, you know, the, just the short temperness, you know, all the, the high anxiety, you know, a little bit of depression. I seriously don't know where I would be if she hadn't stuck through. Um, you don't even know if you'd be alive. One of the sort of the turning points towards the end was when I was starting to see my kids mirroring my uh, inappropriate behaviour, uh, which is the short fuse and the yelling. Um, but when my kids start to mirror this behaviour, it's like, nah, you're at the start of your life. And yeah, they're, they're really cool kids. And I think, I think they can tell when I'm having a bad day and they'll just come give you a hug. I left defence with no one knowing. I didn't leave on a medical discharge, which not because nothing against medical discharges, but I wanted to leave with, with mana, with honour, with my dignity. Um, and I wanted to unpack it on my own time and my own terms. I left the military after getting a Chief of Defence Force Forces commendation. A few days later, you know, I was, you know, talking to Veterans Affairs uh, and you know, and then the whole world started to sort of, you know, change. You know, I don't think, I don't think um, PTSD, you can actually, there's a cure for it. But you learn to live alongside it and you, you learn to how to cope, uh, what triggers there are. You're way more self-aware. Well, this is the ultimate test. You know, short of going back to uh, Kandahar, um, this is, this is the, the ultimate test. I'm going to be uh, in, a, in a stadium or whatever next to amputees, uh, people who've been gunshot wounds, uh, burns, uh, who represent or have similar images or similar injuries to the people that, that came through the trauma bay. I, that, that is the biggest challenge for me. Um, I, the Invictus Games is a physical challenge for me, it's a mental challenge. Uh, and my mental challenge is being able to get out of bed every day there. I can do it here, but then I'm not surrounded by amputees or you know, a constant reminder. Uh, there I'm gonna be in a, a military environment um, surrounded by you know, veterans who have, have, have given something for their, their country. So, so winning for me is being on the start line and just, yeah, just being able to talk to people. The cycling will be one of the events I'm keen to, to do well at. I just know that it's not really suited for me. I'm more of an endurance cyclist, uh, you know, for racing 100, 160 plus Ks, uh, rather than a 30 minute street race. By committing to something, by going through a training regime, and by committing and getting to the start line, putting yourself up there, putting yourself into a vulnerable position, and getting up on the start blocks, getting into that chair, um, I think you, you've already won, and everything else from that is, is icing. My name is Soren Hall, I'm a former health officer in the New Zealand Army, and I am an Invictus competitor.